Bonjour, mes amis. Je suis très heureuse uh, d'être ici. Wait a minute. Uh, C'est mon première fois à Luxembourg et à uh, Vox Days Luxembourg. Et aujourd'hui, je dois parler en, sur le sujet en régime sain pour votre application Java. Je parle français juste un petit peu et je pense que ce sera mieux que je parle anglais. Mais pour la prochaine fois, je ne sais pas, mais si je serai acceptée pour Lux Vox Days Luxembourg en euh, euh, 2024, je peux essayer euh, français. So, today I'm going to talk about a healthy diet for a Java application. And yes, talk will be in English. Sorry for that. But next time I'll try to learn French better. So, Uh, let me introduce my, myself before we start. My name is Margarita. I work as software engineer at Sonar. I'm also speaking at some conferences. I'm also involved in some organizing of some conferences. And when I was in my native hometown, Kyiv, I was organizing Kotlin user group and conferences like DevOps Ukraine, Kotlin Night Kyiv, and... Uh, and online conference like Kotlin. And um, for my everyday job, I do static analysis for Java, Kotlin, Scala, and a few other languages. And this is my Twitter handle, so you want, if you want, you can follow me. Sometimes I tweet some technical stuff, sometimes about life. So yeah, this is me. And there is one more important thing that you should know about me. As I work at Sonar, and for three years I live in Geneva, I was born and raised in Kyiv. And you know, in my home country, homeland, we have some problems with our neighbors. And uh, it's a huge problem, and my family is still there. So if you feel like you want to support us, this is a QR code. So you can do some donation to our charity fund, uh, Come Back Alive, and help Ukrainians to fight for, our, for their freedom, for our freedom. So the most important part of my talk is done. Now I can. <laughs> Let's continue with some fun. Uh, before we start, some disclaimer. What I'm going to talk about today is not a rocket science. You probably already heard about all the things, you already know them, but I'll try to structureize your knowledge and maybe to come up with some algorithms, some solutions, maybe some ideas for your future. And another disclaimer, there is not a silver bully. So every single out of memory, every single problem with memory is unique and you had to investigate it on your own. So I'll try to give you some recipes, some advice what you can do, but it's still up to you how you can investigate it and how you can fix it. So yeah, how it all started, why I'm, all, why I'm here speaking about Java memory leaks. Uh, it happened some months ago when this guy, if I don't know if you know him or not, but this is a principal engineer languages and runtime at Amazon Web Services, I'm pretty famous for his uh, valuable contributions in OpenGDK and projects like GMH, JC Stress, Java Object Layout, and so on, Alexei Shipilov. So he is also famous in our company in Sonar because he analyzes OpenGDK in Sonar Cloud. So you can technically look at how quality gates and all the metrics look for OpenGDK in our uh, tool. And he analyzes C++ and Java code there. One day he came to our team, to me because we are friends, said like, I want to analyze Java and C++ code for OpenGDK in Sonar Cloud, which is great, using just three gigabytes of RAM which is not so great for us, uh, and he can't. So technically it fails. And in order to understand why this is a valid requirement to us, we need to understand how our tools work. Uh, please raise your hand if you're familiar with SonarCube, SonarCloud, SonarLint. Oh, great, a lot of people. So if you're using our tools, you know how they look like, and you probably know that in most cases the analysis is a part of your CI job. So you have to configure analysis in your CI, and it means that for analysis you pay also to AWS, Azure, or any other, like Google Cloud, or any other cloud provider for your CI. So you're not just paying for our tools, you also pay for your infrastructure. 
and our tools running there. And that's why it's extremely important for us to optimize your codes and to not like use exceed amount of memory because it's the memory that you pay for and we care about our customers. And we saw now lead the situation is even worse because it's an IDE and it's in your local machines. So we're basically using the resources of your local machines. And we try to be as efficient as possible. And that's why this report caught our attention. And at the same time, it happened to me that I came back from my maternity leave and I was trying to get back in shape, like losing some weight to uh, become more fit. And these two topics mixed up in my head. And at some point I asked myself, maybe I'm making my application fit too, like trying to lose memory and then trying to lose weight. And this is how the idea of a healthy diet for a Java application appeared. And now you'll find out that there are a lot of similarities between how you try to get in shape for your body and how you're fixing memory problems with your application. First of all, before you start, before you start doing any investigation, ask yourself, is there any problem? Because if you look in the mirror and you like what you see, you don't need to do anything. You're already doing what you need to do. So just continue doing this. The same with an application. If there are no reports, if you are satisfied with and you are OK to pay that money to the cloud provider, why you care? Like you're already doing your best. Just continue implementing features and going on. So if you are satisfied, don't go there. Be why? Because as a Java developer, there was a reason why I'm Java developer, not, for example, C++ developer. I know in Java there is garbage collector. It has to do all the magic. Why should I care about the memory? And back in my university times, I was extremely bad with pointers and memory. And that's why I gave up on C++ and now using Java. And now you're telling me that I have to care about memory. Why? The problem is that garbage collector is great. It's a great guy. He is helping a lot, but he's not a wizard. He cannot collect objects if they're still referenced. So basically, garbage collector is collecting garbage, but he cannot distinguish what is garbage, what is not garbage, if we are not telling him what is garbage, what is not garbage. So that's why we still have to care about the memory, even though we are Java developers and we have a garbage collector. And so, OK, we identified that there is some problem. We want to do something. But how to, to understand that there is some problem? There should be some symptoms. For example, if we are talking about our bodies, like one of the symptoms for me was my clothes were too small. Yeah, I can just buy bigger clothes, but if I want to fit my old dress, I need to do something. That fat percentage is too high. You can measure this and you see, OK, I was like in my 20 percentage, now I'm in 30 percentage, and I'm not satisfied with this. Uh, sometimes it could be that it's difficult to run, walk, breathe, because if you have some issues, you can have some health issues, and it decreases your quality of life. BMI might be too high. You might be always hungry, and if you eat, you still have want, want to eat more and more. And this could also be another problem. And of course, that you are not satisfied with your appearance. If you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, you have to do something. The same goes with the Java application. One of the biggest signs of some problems with memory are out of memory errors. If you see out of memory error, maybe there is something bad with your memory managing. Uh, poor performance. Why? Sometimes problems with memory can cause problems with performance. Because garbage collector tries to do something, but he cannot. It takes some time. And you spend your CPU, you spend time on trying to do garbage collection instead of executing your application. Um, then another problem that you try to give more memory to your application, but it doesn't help. The same as like eating more and more. Uh, spend much time on garbage collection, you spend too much CPU, and so on. So there are some signs that can tell you, OK, please look at your memory. Maybe something wrong is there. OK, we identified some problems. We like, defined some symptoms. We see that there is something wrong, but how to understand what exactly is wrong? We need to measure. So the next step is to measure. Uh, when we have problems with body, the first measurement that we can do is like weight. We usually use weight. 
Uh, but it's not enough. It's nice to also know what is the percentage of muscles and fat, what is your BMI, what is your heart rate, what uh, do some blood tests to understand like more detailed picture of your body and your like see your eating habits maybe or something wrong with what you're eating and so on. In the application and the same. First of all, we need to monitor memory usage, but that's not enough. You can also monitor performance, do some profiling. You can monitor CPU usage. Uh, you can generate heap dumps. That's actually a pretty nice option to generate heap dumps on out of memory and maybe generate heap dumps from time to time to compare what's going on in dynamics. Also logs and so on. So try to gather as much as possible for your application to find out the problem. And there is one important point I want to like, had to put to you. Memory usage, single memory usage is not enough. Because let's look at this graph. This is a graph of memory usage of some application. Is there a memory leak? Please raise your hands if you think that there is memory leak here. And please raise your hands if you think there is no memory leak here. <laughs> yeah, the problem is like, we don't know because it's not enough. It could be a normal situation for your application because it's what it should do, or it could be a memory leak because it's like accidental mistake that is leading to this situation. So yeah, you need to have at least something more. So here, if you see this another graph of CPU usage GC activity, you can see if GC tried to do something and he failed, or it was a normal situation. But still, every single case needs a single detailed investigation. So yeah, Alexei Shapilov, of course, he knew all these problems with how hard it is to investigate memory leaks, and he helped us. He provided heap dumps, logs, some memory analysis, and whatever he can do from his perspective, he provided to us. So it was much easier for us to investigate the memory leaks than if he just went to us and said, like, I cannot analyze it without anything. So heap dumps are very useful. And if you experience any problem with sonar applications or any other applications, you should provide heap dump because we cannot investigate out of memory without uh, like any evidence or without a heap dump. So yeah, the first thing that we did with, his, uh, with what he brought to us was looking at the logs and then we found his out of memory error and we found out this stack trace. After deeply analyzing the stack trace, we found out this line, which is a com.sonar.cpp package. And you're like, wait a minute. Com.sonar.cpp package means that this problem is coming from C++ analyzer. And I'm on a team working on Java analyzer, not on C++ analyzer. So like, we are not these people. It's not us. The obvious solution would be to give this problem to C++ analyzer team and say, okay, guys, that's your problem, fix it. And now, like, please be attentive. I need to reveal one secret to you. That's a secret that will change your life. If you don't want to hear it, uh, close your ears because your life will never be the same after this. So, are you ready? If you have out of memory error and you have a stack trace for it, the best, the best thing that you can do with the stack trace to take it carefully and throw it away. Because stack trace in out of memory analysis in most cases is useless. Because out of memory happens when you ran out of memory. It doesn't say where the problem is. It could be that something else ate like 80 or 90% of the memory at out of memory appeared in the part of the application that ate just 10% of the memory and it was a normal consumption. We cannot know and stack trace is useless. Remember this. And if you have an out of memory, don't send us stack trace, please. Send us heap dumps. So yeah, that's why of course we haven't given this to C++ analyzer people and we started investigation on our own. So yeah, we know how to define that there is some problem, we know what we can measure, like do as much measurement as we can do. Now let's analyze. 
And the best way to analyze is to look at the heap dump. Here's some demo. So I'll open the Visual VM. It's the tool that I use most cases to analyze the heap dump. In most cases, it's enough. Sometimes you need something more, but in simple cases, Visual VM is a great tool. So please raise your hands if you've ever seen this UI. Okay, it's half of the audience. So this is like a heap dump in Visual VM looks is a summary like the first page if you see it. There are a lot of numbers, a lot of metrics, some instances, classes, whatever, a lot of information. And it's extremely hard to read if you don't know what to read. Usually like for me when I see this, I try to see if there is something that catches my attention, some exceeded numbers. For example, here you can see that classes by size of instances, you can see that byte array instances of byte array are holding almost 96.1% of all the heap. Feels like something tricky, like fishy. Maybe we can go here and explore. So you can go here and you see that byte array is a class and here are all the instances. And there are all the instances, takes a lot of memory. And you see like the size sometimes, yeah, is not enough. You also need to calculate retain size. Retain size, it means how much of the memory would be freed if you, if you collect this instance. In our case, it's byte array, so we don't really care much, but in other classes, it might be useful. So, GC root. Another point, if you just look at these objects, you cannot understand, like, there are some objects, there are a lot of them, they hold some memory, but how can I do any other investigation? And one of the most important tabs here is GC root. GC root, it means the path why this object is still in memory. So why GC cannot collect it, who holds the reference to this memory and shows you some sort of a graph. So this is an object. You can see that this object is a value in some string. The string is a content in some full name. And this full name is basically uh, some element data in some array list. And an array list is a name cache field in example names cache, which is a static field. Already sounds tricky. Why it's tricky? I have a question for you. Let's get back to my slides. I have a question to you. What, when static fields are eligible for garbage collection? I will need you to raise your hands one more time. Uh, please raise your hands if you think that when the last instance is collected. Nobody? Okay. A second option, when class instance is collected. Yeah, I, I would raise my hand. <laughs> okay, when GVM exits. Okay, obvious, like when GVM exits, everything is garbage collected. <laughs> okay, when class is unloaded. Wait, I see some people raising hands more than once, which is nice. And none of the above. So technically, we are all right and not right at the same time, because like, if you answer that when class instance is collected and one class is unloaded, you are halfly right, halfly not right. And of course, I'm not tackling when GVM exits because yes, when GVM exits, everything is garbage collected. But I'm asking about eligible for garbage collect <laughs> collection. So yeah, what happens actually? Usually when you do write your program, you're operating with instances. You create an instances of some classes or you use some dependency injection framework that is creating instances for you, whatever. But you're operating with instances. Every instance holds the reference to the class of which instance it is. So for example, if you were talking like about class, about instances of class person, somewhere that should be object class person. And this every instance holds reference to there. Every class holds references to its static fields. So static fields are, uh, are accessible via class, not via instance. So they can be accessed via instan um, in the instance via class, but the reference is in the class. And then the most interesting part, class 
holds a reference to the class loader that loaded this class. And every class loader knows about all the classes that it loaded. It means that if we want static field, any static field to be eligible for garbage collection, we should remove all the references of this field. And it means we have to get rid of a class. And in order to, uh, to make class eligible for garbage collection, we should have no instances and no class loader. And then the most interesting part, when class loaders are garbage collected? The answer is it depends, but if you're not using custom class loaders, but application class loaders or default class loaders, never. They live as long as your application is alive, which transitively means that your static fields live as long as your application is alive. So the most honest answer would be that static fields are eligible for garbage collection when class and class loader are collected. And it will happen simultaneously because they hold a cross reference to each other, like circular, circular reference to each other. Okay, so this implies that static is like sugar for our application. It's pretty easy to add this word, and then it's pretty hard to get rid of all the static fields. So remember, if you are not doing any uh, custom class loaders, static members live forever. That's why static members should be avoided. If you still need them and you cannot avoid static member, they should not be mutable. And they should not be updated from non-static methods. And in Sonar, we have some rules to try to prevent these errors in the future. Of course, static analysis has some limitations, so we cannot predict all the problems with statics, but at least something. So one rule is that mutable fields should not be public static. It doesn't count about private static, so you still won't find the problem if your field is private static. But in general, please avoid static fields. And another rule is that instance methods should not write to static fields. And yeah, that was one of the problem. It was pretty easy to analyze it, so we just found the root cause, but sometimes it's not that easy to find the root cause. So let's look at the different example. Example here. And see what's going on in a different situation when you have out of memory, but with a different situation. Uh, again, there is something that catches my attention. Byte array instances, again, holds 96.8% of the heap. So let's have a look why. If we go here, again, we have a lot of instances. We can look at the GC root. And we can see that GC root is almost the same. So they are all in memory because of one reason. Yeah, say so yes. This byte array is a value in some string. This string is some content in full name. And now it's not an array. Now we see that it is a hash map. So full name is a key in some hash map. And hash map is actually some name caches in some example controller. Yeah, interesting. Um, when I look here, I think I don't have enough information to say where the problem is. And now I need to look in code. So let's go to, I think, example controller three, example controller two, to understand where the problem is. So you can see, this is the names cache. This is a private final map field, and this is in some example controller. It's not static, so we cannot say that there is this, it's the same problem with statics, but something is fishy here. You can see that when we execute some method hello, so technically some get mapping your controller, you will always put some stuff in names cache, which is growing, but we never retrieve values from there. But then let's investigate it a little bit deeper. Uh, if you look attentively, sure. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. So you can see that name could be either A or B, yes? It cannot have any other values. Cool. Then we create full name out of A or B. So it's 
f of a or f of b. It cannot have any other values. And then we put this into the name cache. We either put f of a or put f of b. So technically, in this map, we can either have f of a with some counter or f of b with some counter. So technically, this map should only contain two elements. And if we look here, for some reason, it contains a little bit more. So do you have any idea where the problem could be? OK, let's have a look. So this is a class full name. Full name is sort of a DTO object. It holds name, it holds content, it has getters, has some um, constructor. So it doesn't seem to be to, re to receive, uh, to, res to have different results for different input. And here's the equals. Auto-generated equals, it's correct. And then if you scroll a little bit down, you see hash code. So uh, what's the problem? Well, it seemed to be, everything seemed to be correct, like equals is correct. The thing is that hash code always returns some random number. If hash code returns some random number, when we try to put some object in a hash map, we calculate the hash code, and we always get different number, and we get different buckets. So we like never able to to use the hash code properly, and that's why we are always adding a new object. Why it should have been just two keys. So there is a mistake in hash code. We should regenerate it properly. This is how we should fix it. Let's let's get back to our slides and do some summary of what we did. So equals hash code are sort of a carbs. They give us a lot of um, uh, power, we have to use it, we need to use them in our code, but we need to use them carefully. Because equals hash, hash code should be used properly and written properly. You should most likely use auto-generated stuff or don't implement them by yourself. And uh, if you're implementing them, uh, you need to always override equals and hash code together. That's one point. And another point, there is a contract. If equals returns true, hash code must, all, must be the same. So if, if equals returns true for two objects, these two objects should have the same hash code. And in our example, we've seen that we violated this contract. And if we like never go into this full name implementation of equals or hash code, which you don't usually do, because you assume like everybody writes this correctly, you will never find the root cause of the problem. So we need to write them carefully. And Another point that hash map keys must be immutable because if they're immutable, you face exactly the same situation because you change the, uh, the returned value by the hash code. In Sonar, we have a rule for some of these issues. For example, equal set hash code should be written in pairs. Uh, however, we don't have a rule that you are not violating the contract. So not violating the contract, it's still for you. Maybe we'll consider to implement it somehow in the future. However, you should understand that static analysis has some limitations and it's extremely difficult to detect whether you violated the contract or no. So, okay, we found the root cause. We need to fix them. So let's maybe explore some other examples where fixing the root cause, uh, where we have the problem because of a different root cause. So here's the third example. We can have you can see the similar things like byte array go here. It's computing. We have look at GC roots, look them to here. And the thing is when I look here, I don't really understand what's going on. Like I look at these GC roots, and to me they say nothing. So maybe I went in some wrong direction. Let's get back to the summary. So yeah, byte array is dead end. String 
most likely string is here because of a byte array, because byte array is a, a field in string. So let's keep it. And maybe let's have a look at the third option, which is object array. So let's look here and see that retain size of all the object arrays is almost two gigabytes. So it seems to me that we are on the right, um, on the right route. So let's generate GC routes. We can see, look at a couple of them, that they're pretty similar, so probably problem is here. So this object array is element data in some array list, which is some objects in big object, which is this dollar zero in big object, dollar small object, which seems pretty fishy. And this is uh, all holds to some small object in example controller three. What's interesting about this all trace? You can see that small object is an inner class in big object. And it holds a reference to the big object. And big object brings our uh, object array, which holds a lot of memory. So we can look at this example in the code. Sample controller three. And yes, indeed. If we look at this, sorry, in this controller, you can see that small objects is a private field where we add something. But small objects, they're really small. They don't have any field. So it means they, their retained size should be pretty small. However, small object is an inner class in big object. And that means that it implicitly holds the reference to big object. And when you create a small object, you do it with new big object, new small object, you always have this reference to new big object. And then you have all this list of objects, which is, you can see one million of objects, and it um, pollutes your memory. So what's the problem here? The problem that our class small object is not static. And you can see that IntelliJ yells a lot about this. So you can do make static. And if you make it static, now small object has no reference to big object. And uh, your memory consumption is much smaller than it was. So in some cases, the memory leaks could be caused by not properly using inner classes. Because first of all, they should be static. If you still need non-static, take care of the like cycle and keep in mind that you have a reference to outer class and it could uh, cause some memory leaks. So keep in mind the memory management here. And we have a rule for this, uh, that inner classes that don't reference their own classes should be static. Unfortunately, this rule won't be triggered if you are using some fields of your uh, owning class. And if you are doing this, you most likely have to refactor your code or keep in mind that you might have problems with memory later. And Let's have a look at the last demo, force one. Uh, let's get to our usual path. So byte array, calculate GC roots. And you can see interesting thing here that all of them are referenced through some thread local in some task thread, whatever. And we can find this in the code that we have some object referenced at the thread local that we set, but we never had set. What's the problem with thread locals? Uh, in thread locals, they live as long as the thread is alive. Oh, by the way, raise your hands if you ever use thread locals in your code. Well, not a lot of people. So maybe it's something interesting for you. So thread locals live as long as thread is live. So if you created a new thread and it's garbage collected, you don't have thread locals, so you should not care. Where the problem? The problem is that you usually don't create new threads by yourself. You're using some thread pools, execution services, or whatever, and threads are reused. And if threads are reused, thread locals live there as long as you don't unset them. So 
That's why thread locals should be unset manually. And in Sonar, we have rules to detect this if your thread local was set but was never unset. So, okay, we fixed some problems with memory leaks. Of course, that's not all the possible problems. There could be much more, but we are limited in our time. So I will let you discover some more problems with your memory and fix it. But what's the next step? Once we identified some memory leak, we were able to fix it. The next possible step is to improve. So let's go some extra mile and improve our memory consumption. Now let's talk a little bit about memory leaks versus memory footprint. Before this point, we were talking about memory leak. Memory leak is a situation when you hold some memory that you don't need, it's increasing, so it's more of an extreme situation when you have fire to fire fight to, to reduce the amount of memory used. So think about it like you already have a huge problems with your weight, like overweight or some health issues, and you need to firefight them. And memory footprint is a little bit different story. Memory footprint refers to just the total amount of memory that your program is using. So fixing memory leaks, it's more like a firefighting when you have extreme problems, while reducing memory footprints, it's more about when you're already in in a pretty good shape, but you just want to have some last things like have a little bit more muscles, have a little bit less fats, like have some uh, abs, whatever. So it's more when you're already good enough, but you just want to do better. And this is what about reducing memory footprint. So firstly, you're fixing memory leaks. Once you fix them, let's go and improve memory footprint. What we can do? First of all, we can remove some references manually. Just set up nulls for the references that, that you don't need. Uh, it looks a little bit like C++ style, but I saw some people in Java world doing this. It works, but why not? Uh, another point, custom class loaders. We were talking about statics in the beginning of our talk, um, of my talk, that statics live forever unless you are not writing some custom class loaders. So, if you want to garbage collect your static fields earlier, you can write your custom class loader, for example, like this. And once you don't hold any reference to class loader and the class, your static fields are collected. So this is just an example how you can do it. Another possible thing is to minimize the living scope. Try to prefer, uh, prefer the variables as close to the use point as possible. Uh, prefer some local variables instead of global ones, instead of global fields. More, uh, go more local and more straight to the point. And if you still need some local stuff, some fields, do all the necessary cleanup. Because if you don't need something anymore, clean it, remove it. Uh, to avoid some uh, useless memory consumption. And another thing is you can use weak references. Because in uh, Java there is a way to say a like, garbage collector that he can collect this object even if we are referenced to it um, because we don't care or we can recreate this object anytime. So this is how we can use big reference. For example, in our example with big object, we could have used big reference and say, okay, garbage collector, if you need some memory, you can still collect this. And then once we need it again, we will just recreate it. But however, when you're reducing memory footprint, you should understand that balance is the key here. For example, when I was losing weight, it was I faced some situation when I lost, lost too much, and then it was harder for me to take my baby, to lift some heavy weights, and to actually work normally. So it was too much. I had to gain a little bit more. The same happens with your application. Uh, reducing memory footprint too much might be compensated with some performance degradation because if you need to load unload classes all the time when you need them, it takes time. So it takes your performance. If you need to recreate objects all the time because you're using big reference, it's also some performance degradation because it takes time to recreate the object again. So you need to find some balance and understand what works for your application and what is the best for your application. 
So do you care that much about the memory? And you can ignore some performance degradation. Or performance is more important, so I'd rather keep everything under my hands. And you need to buy and find your own balance here, and I cannot tell you what's the best way for you. OK, we improved. We reduced memory footprint, so our application is good enough. What is, could be the last step here? The last step, to my mind, is to prevent it from happening in the future, prevent and don't let other developers to make these mistakes and not to face out of memory again. Remember how it all started. Was Alexei Shapilov with I want to analyze with three gigabytes of RAM, but I can't. So what was the problem here? If we look at about how Sonar, in simple words, is executing, we have some plugins. For example, in this case, Java plugin and C++ plugin for any language. And plugins are in a list, and they're executed one by one. Because they are in a list, they will all be uh, accessible or from like, the root of your application unless they all execute. It means that if Java plugin, what actually happened? It almost like 80 or 90% of the memory because it put a lot of garbage and it's still in the memory. C++ analyzer was not like enough. It could not handle their job because there was not enough memory left for C++ analysis. And that's why we had out of memory. So out of memory happened in C++, but the memory leak was in Java. So this is again the point about the useless stack trace. What can we do to prevent this kind of situation in the future? First of all, we can reduce the life of the plugin. Like, for example, Q might work better than list there. Or we can do some cleanup in between. For example, Q. If our plugins were in a queue, and every time they're executed, they're just removed from the queue, we won't have this problem. Because once Java analysis is done, it's in then garbage collected, and then C++ plugin can execute its job. But if we had it written like this, we will never face the situation when we report we have this memory leak reported, and we won't be able to fix it. So it comes with some cost. So how can we prevent issues like this in the future? First of all, follow the healthy diet. So all the things that I told you uh, in, in this in scope of this talk, like don't use statics, mutability, like equals hash code contract, that's all could be considered as a healthy diet. Then monitor memory usages. Like monitor before you have a problem. Do it from time to time to understand and to, to see that you have a problem before your users report it. And then look at GC logs from time to time. Uh, perform stress testing. For example, in our case, we could have performed the analysis on some lower amount of memory to understand what are the boundaries. Uh, use Visual VM, some memory analyzer, uh, like generate heap dumps from time to time. And one of the most interesting points that you can actually add some tests. And there is a project called Java Object Layout that can show you the amount of memory, uh, the actual object layout on your architecture operating system, and actually how much memory some object takes in your application. You can use it to write some test. For example, like this. You remember that there was some memory leak with big object. You fixed it, but to prevent it from happening to the f in the future, you can assert that the layout of this object is less than some maximum size. And if the uh, layout of this object will be increased, this test will fail. And then you either accept it as a nor normal situation that just a normal growth, or you'll see there was a memory leak, and this test helped you to prevent it. So this could be just an idea how you can prevent the problems like this in the future. And this is the summary of a healthy diet, what we should, should or should not do. First of all, avoid statics and mutability, clean thread locals, free resources, avoid non-static inner classes. If still need some of them, be careful. And uh, reduce the scope of references. And the most important, 
monitor memory usage before you have a problem. And uh, the last point that I wanted to share with you is like, are you actually interested how the story with Alexei ended? Like, uh, raise your hands if you think that it ended successfully, like we fixed the problems. What did we like we fixed memory leaks and Alexei is happy. <laughs> and um, raise your hands if you think that we failed and we still have this memory leak. Like few people don't believe in my squad. <laughs> so. Maybe you've just increased the, the parameters the parameter of the memory. Let's see. So it ended with some uh, sort of tweets from Alexei that he explained that two months ago he moved to some smaller VM and found out that there is out of memory, reported it, and got for confirmation that there is indeed a leak. Uh, a few months later, we deployed the fixed version of Analyzer, and now from not being able to use 3 gigabytes of RAM, we are down to 1.2 gigabytes at max. Actually, it's a good achievement. I <laughs> And, and, of course, for his valuable contribution, Alexei received a t-shirt as a Sonar community hero. So, one more important takeaway from this presentation. If you have some problems with our products, don't hesitate to report them to us, because we try to react fast, we want to improve our products, and if your contribution is valuable, you can receive this nice t-shirt as well. Can I receive Alexei? Uh, <laughs> You can talk him to him privately, I think. So here are some useful links that I used in the preparing of my presentation. And there are some kudos that I wanted to say. Like, first of all, kudos to Evgeny Mandrikov, who is my husband here, taking care of my baby while I'm giving this presentation. And I can focus on, the, on you and not on my baby at the moment, which is nice. And of course, for his valuable contribution in like listening to my uh, morning and problems of this uh, memory leaks and giving some valuable ideas of how I can fix them. And of course, kudos to my teammates, GVM squad in Sonar, who like received the results of my investigation and actually fixed the analysis. So these guys are really cool. We receive some kudos. And merci pour votre attention. So thank you. <laughs> and any questions? Okay. Uh, about red locals. Uh, okay, this all this messy stuff and there's no reactor. They have the red hooks and they use red locals, I believe. But I, should we still unset them somehow? Because they are full threads. Yeah, I think they know that they should say something if the threads at red locals. That's a good point. I, yeah. Um, is asking about whether we still should unset thread locals if we are using frameworks like Nighty or uh, Reactor. Uh, I think it still depends on the documentation because I'm not a deep expert in the frameworks. We need to have a look. So as a general rule, yes, you have to do it, but maybe they're already doing it for you, but I'm not sure. We need to check with them. Um, not yet, we still discuss, uh, yeah, they, have we actually replaced the list of plugins with the queue plugins? Not yet, we're still discussing it with different teams, what would be the best solution. Uh, we fixed it by actually fixing the leaks in analyzers, and the fix were mostly in leaking uh, uh, IST trees, because, uh, you know, the sonar rules, static analysis works on abstract syntax tree, and sometimes for some caching purpose, we wanted to save something. And uh, the problem with AST is that you cannot just save one node. If you save in one node, this node holds a reference to the parent node and the parent nodes. And technically, you are saving the whole tree. And if you save it like millions of times, 
it takes some a little bit of space. So that's what actually was happening. We were caching a lot of ASTs and never cleaning them up. Oh, I, so you didn't need some of them? Uh, in some cases, we refactored it like we didn't need them at all. In some cases, we just added some cleanup. So it still depends, uh, but that was nice to investigate them and to find out all this problem, all the problems like this. How much time did it take? Uh, take what? Uh, fixing the thing. Fixing was pretty fast. Uh, the hardest point was more in the investigation to understand what's going on. And, but once you have all the heap dumps, once you understand what's actually the reason, and uh, you see, um, all these numbers you can easily identify. The, the biggest problem, I guess, was more into when you're looking at a heap dump, you have a, a lot of uh, numbers. And in the cases that I showed you, there were like drastical difference. You have 90% of something using the most of the memory and everything else. So it was pretty easy to understand what's getting the most of the memory. In our case, it was like 30%, 20%, so you need to have like a few wrong passes to understand what is actually holding most of the memory. Thank you. Thank you. So. Thank you for the slides. Thank you.